Welcome to The Great Reveal. Pictures of Jesus in the Hebrew Bible with Dr. Richard Booker. In Luke 24, Jesus said that everything written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and Psalms was about Him. This means the Jesus story begins in Genesis. How can this be? The story of Jesus' life revealed in pictures throughout the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. When you see the pictures, you see the person of Jesus. And when you see the person, you'll see yourself because you become part of the picture. Join Dr. Booker for these insightful teachings as your spiritual eyes open to see what was hidden is now revealed in each message of this exciting series. Pictures of a person. Can you say that with me? Pictures of a person. This is very, very, very important. I've been teaching the Bible for since 1974. So that's more years than many people have been living. And it takes a while to grasp what this book really is. And uh, I've come to understand that the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, is a picture book. That's really, really a big understanding that we can have. It's a picture book. It's a picture of a person. And as followers of Jesus, we come to know that the person is Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior. And God painted this picture, though, in the ancient culture of the Bible. And that's where our problem is. We don't live in that culture. <laughs> We live in a modern Western culture. And so the Bible people wouldn't understand our culture at all. They would have any idea what we're talking about most of the time. And if we go back, then it's the same with us. We don't understand that ancient culture because it's so foreign to us. And so the challenge is God painted these pictures in that culture. So if the culture is foreign to us, we don't know the pictures are there, see? We don't see them. And some, we, we get the idea then, well, that stuff's old and done away with because it's not relevant for us because we don't see those pictures. <clears throat> but when you know that there are pictures and you start understanding the culture, well, I've written so many books about the culture of the Bible. You start seeing the pictures. When you see the pictures, guess what? You see the person. And here's the rest of that. When you see the person, you see yourself. Selah. Now pause and meditate. Because he's representing you in the picture. That's how simple it is. The pastor's nodding his head. He got it. Hallelujah. He's an advanced student here tonight. It's that simple. It's a picture of a person. When you see the person, you see yourself because you're in him, in the pictures. He's representing you. You, you understand? That's why this dusty old stories in the ancient culture should be of importance to us because they're not only about Jesus, they're also about us. So our challenge is the culture of the Bible is so different from ours. And Jesus lived and taught in that culture, not ours. So we have so many things we know in the Bible, so many wonderful stories. But our big problem is this. We don't know the context of these stories <laughs> because the context is in the ancient culture. So we just kind of pull them out of context and make a wonderful sermon, but it may mean something completely different that actually means in the Bible. And you might even live your life around something you think that means and turns out to be not what it means at all. That's why this is very, very important. So a lot of our doctrines and theologies are based on Western Christian culture, 
not the one that Jesus lived in. So that's our challenge. Now let's look at the next picture up here. God's big picture. Can you say that with me? God's big picture. Very good. One of the biggest pictures that God has painted is the Feast of the Lord. We're going to just have an introduction to that in our teaching today. And then we'll take each one next time as we are able to go through these. So it's a big, a big assignment from the Lord. So your prayers are greatly appreciated. So God's big picture, the Feast of the Lord. There are many pictures in the Hebrew Bible, but this is, of course, one of the biggest. And if you look at the picture, you see there's seven pieces in the picture. Passover, can you say that with me? Unleavened bread. First fruits. Pentecost. Trumpets. Atonement. And tabernacles. All right, very good. So these are seven feasts that make up the feast of the Lord. And there's seven pieces of the picture. And they all point to the person. Now, Jesus, or Yeshua, as many of our friends like to say, God knows his son's name in whatever language, so he's not uptight about all that, right? Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. So he is the reality of these festivals because they're pictures of him, see? Now, when we say he fulfilled them, that doesn't mean in, in, the, in the Hebrew, Hebraic, fulfilled doesn't mean done away with so they're not around anymore. It means the reality of them, you see. So he is the human embodiment of what these were pictures of. So you study the picture so you can know the person better. And when you know the person better, you see how he was the reality of them. And then you're going to see how you internalize their significance into your life as a Jesus person. See? It's really that simple. But it's somehow we make this a hard book. It's really simple if you understand the basic story that's in the Bible. So to learn about the feast is to learn about Jesus and how they relate to our lives today. So how many of you here want to be blessed? Would you raise your hand? You need a blessing. Well, everybody raise their hand. Some halfway raise their hand. You only need a halfway blessing. Okay. Here is Psalm 89:15. Now, this is an amazing slide. I put it in Amplified Bible because it, without that, it passes us by and we don't even know what they're talking about. Here's Psalm 89, 15. Blessed are those who know the joyful sound. Can you say that with me? Blessed are those who know the joyful sound. Now, as Western people, we just read right past that and say hallelujah, and we don't even know what it's talking about. <laughs> you know? So here's what it says in the Amplified. It explains it for us who understand and appreciate the spiritual blessings symbolized by the feast. Oh my goodness. So you see, it's a technical phrase in the Bible. The joyful sound refers to the reality of the feasts of the Lord and what they are and what they mean for your life personally. And so God promises a blessing for us if we can grasp them and embrace the spiritual reality of them in our lives. So we all need to be blessed. This is a blessing that God has promised us. If we can understand what these feasts mean, how they point to the person, and then internalize their spiritual significance for us. It's, I keep repeating that because that's really what the Bible is about, okay? Now we're going to look at the next slide, and this is really amazing. Genesis 1, 14. Look, now this is long before Moses, right? <laughs> long before Abraham, long before Leviticus, <laughs> long before the... Torah, long before the law, long before anything in the Bible ever. And look at Genesis 1, 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens 
to divide the day from the night, and we know what that is up there in the sky, and let them be for signs and seasons. Oh, something, God is giving us a little hint of something here. Signs and seasons, and that Hebrew word is for seasons is moadim. Can you say that with me? Moadim, the em on the end means it's plural, moadim. And for days and years. Wow. So God is giving us a little hint of something here. <clears throat> that something is coming. And that the heavenly bodies are more than just for knowing when it's daylight and dark. <clears throat> uh, but it's for... Because the Bible is on a lunar calendar. That really throws us off here in the Western world. The Bible is on a lunar calendar. <clears throat> and so the people would use the lunar calendar, the new moon, see, to know when it was a feast season, a moadim. Can you say that word with me, moadim? Moadim. This is how Jesus talked. <laughs> he said, Moadim. He was a Jewish man. So there's a couple of things here. Number one, it's a fixed appointed time or season or place where God would meet with his people. Now, how many of you would like for God to meet with you? Oh, we got to get desperate sometime for him to show up because we kind of get, you know, distracted with American bread and circus. Thank you for that faint amen. <laughs> God wants to meet with us. Remember he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. God wants to meet with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to have a, a visit with us. He wants to live inside of us. He wants to make himself known to us. He wants to meet with us. And so as believers, we have the Spirit of God in us. We can meet with God 24-7, whenever, because he lives inside of us. But he also made special external times when he would show up more than normal. See what I'm trying to say? When he would come and meet with us. It specifically refers to God's appointed biblical holy days. God's appointed biblical holy days, which are these feasts. As God's people kept the feast, they would have a holy encounter with the living God. Wow. That's what you read about in the Bible, you know, in both Testaments. Of course, just keeping it, if it was just a religious thing, wouldn't do anything for them. But they had to have their heart for what it was really about. We can understand that. Amen. So God gave them these festivals, these feasts as times when he would specially come and meet with them beyond the norm of him working with them in their lives, okay? So, Moadim. And so, God wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to bring heaven down to earth now. It's not die and go to heaven, although that's the nice thing too, of course. <laughs> that would be the ultimate goal, I guess. But along the way, God wants us to have a taste of heaven down here. We pray all the time, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't we pray that, you know? So his kingdom life coming from heaven to earth, and he shows that in picture form with these feasts more than probably anything else in the Bible. If you'd like to meet with God, let me introduce you to the feasts. Amen. Leviticus. <laughs> yes, I'm having a, a Zoom meeting every Tuesday morning with an Orthodox Jewish friend in Hebron. He's not a follower of Yeshua, but uh, a good man. And I was telling him my story, and 
he still can't get over how I could have found God in Leviticus. He talks about it be, being the most boring of all the boring books. Even the Jewish man says this, you know, an Orthodox Jewish man that I love dearly. <clears throat> but it depends on whether or not you find the pictures. If you find the pictures, all of a sudden it comes alive. So here's Leviticus 23, verse 4. Can we say it out loud with me together? These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations. Now here's another Hebrew word, mikrah. Can you say that with me? Mikrah is easy to say, mikrah. Which you shall proclaim, announce, observe, celebrate at their appointed times, moedim, see, in their seasons. Okay, so this is a very important verse. Now, Leviticus 23 has the summary of all the feasts. And you're going to have the great pleasure and blessing of getting to go through that verse by verse when, when I'm here along the way. But it will be a different chapter when we're through. You're going to see the Messiah there. And when you see the Messiah, you see yourself. Amen. So a couple of things here on this slide. Notice it. It does not say it's the feast of the Jews. Amen. Oh me. It says it's the feast of feast of the oh of the Lord. Okay. Now God gave the feast, we'll just define all that in a minute, to the Jewish people, but for all of God's people for all time. As Jesus' people, we just see a celebration of them a little differently in the person, which many of our Jewish, most Jewish people haven't seen that yet. So these are the feasts of the Lord through them, but for all of God's people, okay? So feasts, when we think of feasts, Turkey and dressing and cranberry sauce. <laughs> right? <clears throat> we think about eating a lot of food. That's what the word feast means to us. <clears throat> but it means something different in the Bible. It's not about encountering Grandma's Thanksgiving table. It's about encountering God. So... Uh, we're going to learn what these are and just as an introductory teaching here in our gathering today. So, Moedim is the Hebrew word for feast. And we just read here in Leviticus, holy convocations. So, special assemblies, special gatherings. And that word is what? Mikra. Say it with me. Mikra. Okay. A holy convocation. Can you say that with me? A holy convocation. So that's what the word Mikra means. It's a holy convocation. It's uh, a sacred assembly. That's the next thing up there, I think. A sacred assembly. So it's, it's not uh, secular. Assembly, it's a sacred assembly where God calls the people to meet with him in a special way beyond the norm. All right, what else does it say? A dress rehearsal. Can you say that with me? A dress rehearsal. Now, Peggy and I had a, an Arab Shabbat Friday night event in Houston for, oh, 15, 18 years. Tim and Ruth were a huge part of that. And... We'd have 40 or 50 people on the presentation team doing all kinds of things. I think the very first one we ever had, we had about 60 or 70 people just on the presentation team. Singers and dancers and musicians and banner makers and processional people, flag wavers, all this stuff. Well, you don't just show up and do this. <laughs> You're going to break your neck if you just show up and try to do You've got to have a what? Dress rehearsal. 
a dress rehearsal. Thank you, Ruth. And those things look pretty bad, believe me. <laughs> and you say, oh, Lord, keep the car running, Peggy. We better get out of town quick. <laughs> You have to a dress rehearsal. You have to practice so you know what everybody's supposed to be doing and when and where and how and all this stuff. And so God had these feasts as a dress rehearsal for the people. And what they were doing is the next little line up here, acting out the drama of redemption. Can you say that with me? Acting out the drama of redemption. So they were acting it out. So that when Messiah came, they, they well, there, that's, this is what we've been doing all along, see? Acting out the drama of redemption. So one more line on that. From a Christian view, we would call it a Jesus festival. Right? See how this is coming together here? You kind of start off vague, and then it starts coming together. Now, way back in the 70s, that's the 1970s, before most of y'all were born, of course, God was really on the move all over the world, and he awakened by his spirit a lot of millions of dead denominational Christians. Some of y'all maybe been part of that. So we had such and a love affair with Jesus that the normal meetings just wasn't enough for us. We needed more of him. So when I say we, I mean the collective we. We would organize special concerts and praise celebration events. And we, again, the collective we, rented out big coliseums in Houston. It might be 15, 20,000 people spend all, all day praising the Lord, celebrating Jesus, simple love songs to the Lord. And we called them Jesus Fest. We couldn't get enough of him. Now, I'm quite a bit older now than then but in my current age, I still can't get enough of him. Hallelujah. And I'm not, I don't get into the building quite as fast as I did then. <clears throat> but I still can't get enough of him. Like I've been married to Peggy. We'll have our 55th wedding anniversary soon. Still can't get enough of her. Still can't get enough of Jesus. Jesus Fest. Wouldn't you like to have a Jesus Fest? Ah, I wish we could do those things all over again in Houston. They were so wonderful. But you got to keep moving on, right? Celebrating Jesus. That's a good thing to do, isn't it? And he gave these festivals as guides on how to do that. The Feast and the Messiah. Again, pictures of the person and ministry of Jesus. You might remember in Luke 24 on the Maus Road story, Jesus appeared to two of his disciples and he, he gave them this great teaching that all, everything written in the Law of Moses, the Prophets and the Psalms, that was the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible at that time, everything written the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms is about me, he said. Wow. I wonder what he told them. Well, God let me be a third disciple on that Emmaus Road in 1974. And that's when I had my encounter with God that changed my life forever. You know, in John 5... Verses 45 and 46, Jesus said that Moses wrote about me. What? How can this be? You know, in all these decades I've been teaching the Bible, I've, I've never heard one Christian that come up, Dr. Booker, Brother Richard, how did Moses write about Jesus? How can this be? 
no one has ever asked me this question. I, it's mind-boggling that, what are they thinking? Or are they thinking at all? <laughs> Moses wrote about me. Well, I would want to know what he said. And you discover the Moses, the Jesus story. It doesn't start at Matthew. It starts at Genesis. It goes all the way through. Jesus celebrated these feasts and claimed to be their true spiritual reality. Now, he didn't have our, Christmas, Christmas, our, our Christian holidays. He didn't have those, you know. He was a Jewish man. He celebrated the biblical feasts, even the non-biblical ones like Hanukkah and Purim. He celebrated those. You read about it in the New Testament. And he claimed to be their spiritual reality. Now, this next sentence is really amazing. Let's look at it. Look at this statement. Every redemptive act in Jesus' life happened on a feast day. That is a wow. Somebody say that with me. Wow. Say it backwards. Wow. All right. Ponder that. Think about it. Contemplate it. Meditate on it. Every major redemptive act in Jesus' life, he did it on a feast day. Well, you know, if we don't know what those things are, we're going to miss a whole lot of what all he was doing, aren't we? So, pictures of a person. If we know the pictures, we know the person better. You don't worship the pictures, but they lead you to the person who you commit your life to. We don't celebrate the pictures. We celebrate the person. But just because the person is here doesn't mean you turn down the pictures. Amen. I have pictures of Peggy in every room at the house because I like to look at her when she's not around. But when she walks in the room, I don't turn down her picture. I guarantee you that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every redemptive act that Jesus did was on a feast day. That ought to get our attention right there. That's enough right there to say we should know what this is all about. The feast and believers. Here we go. Picture the three major encounters with God in the lives of his people. When I say his people, that's me and you. Three major encounters. Now, God can, you can encounter him 24-7, anywhere. But he has three that are off the charts, we might say. Three major encounters. Let's look at them quickly. Passover. Can you say that with me? Passover. And you know that Hebrew word, Pesach? Can you say that? Pesach. Passover, Pesach. God's peace. Anybody need God's peace? The whole world needs it, but they don't know him, so that's why they run into all these things in the world and get themselves all messed up because they're trying to find peace with God. And through Passover, God shows us how to do that. And what's, what's the second one? Pentecost or Shavuot? Shavuot, God's power. Anybody need God's power? The self-destructive habits that keep us in bondage sometime. Have you ever tried to stop smoking? You need a little help for that one. <laughs> Things that we do that we don't like about ourselves, you know. And we've tried for years to get rid of the thing. Well, God can help you get rid of the thing. Amen? So we need God's power. God has a purpose for every believer. You're all priests of God. Now, here's a shocker. We're all in full-time ministry. You think it's the pastor? No, he's the cheerleader. We're all in full-time ministry. And we can't do that without God's help. So Pentecost Shavuot is an outpouring of God's Spirit on us for power to be able to do what He wants us to do. All right, what's Shalom. What a joy to be sharing with you for the next few moments. I want to tell you about one of the most powerful revelations about Jesus in the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians sometimes call the Old Testament. 
and that's the feast of the Lord. You know, we've always sort of thought these were the feasts of the Jews, but they're really feasts of the Lord. And the most exciting thing about all of that is they're pictures of Jesus. Now, as a Christian, I can really get excited about something that helps me know Jesus better. And I bet you can too. When I saw these pictures many years ago, it changed my life forever. And that's why I wrote my book, celebrating Jesus in the biblical feast because I know it will help you in your walk with God also. Now what you're going to learn in this book is about the feast but primarily how they point to Jesus as the person and also how it applies to our lives today. But there's more. These feasts teach us how we can have God's peace, God's power, and God's rest and wow don't we all need those things in our world today? There's also an amazing chart. It took me years to figure out how to show this chart, showing how Jesus is crucified, buried, and resurrected according to the biblical calendar, not the Western calendar, and goes through hour by hour. Just at a quick glance, you can see how it all unfolded in that last week of his life. There's also an amazing chapter on how you as a believer can celebrate these feasts while keeping Jesus as the center and focus of your celebration. And that's important to all of us. Did I mention Bible prophecy? Well, most people are not aware that the prophecies in the Bible about the end times, well, they're all based on the feasts of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? For example, Jesus was crucified at Passover. He was buried at unleavened bread. He was resurrected at first fruits. He sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He's coming again at trumpets. He's going to judge the nations at atonement and establish his kingdom on the earth at tabernacles. Wow! It's all about him. And that's all in this book. Well, it's going to help revolutionize your understanding of the Bible. It will renew your passion for Jesus. It will clarify the prophetic seasons in which we're living. But you know, i got something even more for you. We've got a study guide. And you can get that study guide along with a textbook. You just sit them down side by side. And it's kind of like a tour, a self-guided tour through the book. So you can get the study guide, the book, or just the book yourself uh, at our website at www.rbooker.com. I hope you'll get a copy because it's touched the lives of thousands of people around the world. That's www.rbooker.com. Now here's the phone number if you need to call, 936-441-2171. That's 936-441. 4412171. Thank you for letting me share with you about this amazing book that can have a big impact on your life. God bless you and shalom. Tabernacles, Sukkot, can you say that with me? Sukkot, God's rest, spiritual rest we're talking about. So Passover, peace with God. Pentecost, the power of God. And tabernacles rest in God. Cease from your striving. Uh, you're just abiding in Him, and He's abiding in you, and that's a place of rest. So these festivals picture how Jesus made this a reality in His life and how we can internalize it in our life. God's peace, God's power, and God's rest. So every believer is either at Passover, this is a new thought, at Pentecost, or at Tabernacles. It doesn't have anything to do with denominational stuff and things like that, labels that people put on you. You're either at Passover with God, you're at Pentecost with Him, or you're at Tabernacles with Him. That's, that's what we seek out in the Bible. And Jesus has made the reality of these for us. If we, you know, get plugged into what they are and internalize them in our lives. So many people, every true believer is at Passover, but not, not all have got to Pentecost, and few have gotten to Tabernacles, where they're ceasing from striving to please God. And they're just... Letting him be who he is in you. Amen.
The seven steps in the believer's walk with God. All right, this is very important. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, three major feast encounters with God. And within those are the seven feasts, seven Jesus encounters. Seven steps in the believer's walk with God. Now, if in our Western Christianity, when someone gets born again or saved or whatever terms we use, and they, they, they walk down the aisle or whatever, they say the sinner's prayer, all these terms we use. And they're kind of a baby believer now, and we put them in the newcomer's class for three weeks. They've been living for the devil for 30 years, but they got three weeks to get it all straight. Hello. And then, then they're thrown out there to the wolves. And they're left to themselves. That's the norm. But God has a structure. He has an order to teach you how to grow as a believer and how to mature there in the feast. So Passover, that's for salvation. We know that. All right, next, unleavened bread. What is that for? Oh, my putting off the old nature. We'll see how these things work. Each one of them we'll take separately. Remember Paul said, put off the old? But that wasn't, that's just part of it. What was the next part? First fruits is what? Putting on the new. These festivals are pictures of how Jesus does this for us and how we can internalize this into our lives. All right, let's go to the next slide. So this is going to be number four. Pentecost, God's power for service. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses. Notice it doesn't say you shall witness. It says you'll be a witness. Your life is the witness. You're the salt and light. Your life is the witness. Trumpets, how many of you know there's spiritual warfare going on in your life? Constantly, all the time. And so Jesus is is the horn of our salvation, he's called in Luke. He's the one that gives us the victory. He shows us how to put on the full armor, all those things. It's all in this feast right here. Next one, atonement. Can you say that with me? Atonement. That's a tough one. That's when we get all the yucky burned out of us by the baptism of fire. Hallelujah. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We like that first part, but not the fire part. The fire part, getting all the yuck out. And so these are seven steps in the believer's walk with God from being a brand new baby believer to maturing in your walk with God. It, it's a lifetime of doing this, you know. But if you don't know it's there, of course, you, you're at a disadvantage. Somebody is banging on the door somewhere. I don't know where that's coming from, but hallelujah. Everybody's welcome, Tim. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Tabernacles, God's rest for joy. So that's the seventh one. When you go through these other six in your life, you end up at seven here. You see what I'm saying? You have peace with God. You put off the old. You put on the new. You have the Spirit of God come on you for anointing you with power you allow, you humble yourself before God so he can purify you and you end up at the bottom, God's rest. That's not going to heaven, that's heaven coming down into us, God's rest, okay? Now this is very important, the feast and God's calendar. The feast picture God's redemptive and prophetic calendar. Now. Most Christian people, including ministers, don't know God has a prophetic calendar. But God has a plan. He has a calendar that he's working out throughout history. And guess what? It's not in the Western Seminary book. Sorry. It's in the feast. The feast of the Lord is a picture of God's prophetic calendar. So you, you, you got to know what it is a little bit to get it right, you know. So I have many wonderful friends. I've survived a lot of stuff, you know, a long time. I have many wonderful friends that I love dearly who write books about prophecy and the end times. I've written them myself. I have a three-volume series on the book of Revelation about 
700 and 800 pages all together. I have a book called The End of All Things is at Hand on Prophecy. But here's the thing. If you write these Bible prophecy end time books based on your Western mind, chances are you ain't going to get it all right because it's not based on that. It's based on the biblical calendar. This is God's prophetic season. God has worked throughout history to restore these feasts. God has worked throughout history. One of the things that has grieved my heart, I've carried this burden for so long, is that Christians, for whatever reason, it's nobody's fault, I'm not being critical or nothing, but it's just a heartbreak for people like myself, hardly know anything about our Christian history. Most Christians think that Christian history started when they got born again. <laughs> or when they went to their favorite Bible teacher's Bible college or something. And this is when it all started, you know. So we got 2,000 years that we're caught into and part of that shape where we are right now and what's going on right now. And, you know, there's they got to be, you got to have something in a local church that teaches these things. I know that can't be in the Sunday service. I understand that. But it's got to be somewhere. Because there's no context that Christians have for their lives. So there's this history that God has. And we're part of it. It just went before us. When God restores a feast, he initiates a new prophetic season that changes everything. This is very important. The whole world changes. The Jewish world changes. The Christian world changes. The secular world changes. So God has prophetic seasons. If you want to be blessed beyond the normal, beyond the ordinary, you discover what prophetic season God is in and you get in it and that's where his blessings is going to be for you. I see some of you nodding. Yes, that's better than nodding that. Yes, yeah, very good. That's good. It's very good. This, if you can get this and stay with me these number of times, it will change your life forever. What is a prophetic season? Now, just as God has agricultural seasons, plant the seed at the right time of the year, right? Agricultural seasons. Peggy and I live on a farm, and we have a garden, big garden. And if you don't plant stuff at the right time, forget it. <laughs> you know, and it's very hard. You're dependent totally on God because... It's all the weather, it's all the soil, it's all the seed. Boy, we've learned a lot of lessons in the 10 years we got out of the city and been living on a farm, getting our fingers in the dirt. <laughs> Look here, a prophetic season is a period of time in world history when God moves to establish and restore the spiritual meaning of these feasts in the lives of his covenant people. So it's something he's going to do in world history. So if you don't know anything about all this, you, you don't even know it's going on. So you're just kind of going along. These are major moves of God that affect the whole world. We're fixing to have another one. That's why we need to get keyed in real quick. <laughs> but particularly Jews and Christians. Because we're both the people of the book. We understand it differently, but we're people of the book. When restored, watch this, they move forward God's prophetic calendar towards the coming of Messiah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Meditate on that one. When restored, they move forward God's prophetic calendar towards the coming of Messiah. So let's go to the next slide. You recognize that old boy, Constantine? Let's see what it says up here. In AD 312-313, the Roman Emperor Constantine opened the Roman Empire to Christianity. Now that was good. If you're in the Colosseum as a believer and you're the next one they're going to let out there for the lions to have and all of a sudden the emperor does this rather than this, and stops the games and the killing of the Christians, 
That's good. Amen? Amen. He saved your life. And you're going to look at him as a savior in some way. He's, he's the great emperor. But we're going to see that the compromise that he forced was not the best for us all. He replaced the biblical calendar with the Roman calendar. That's what we have. And forbid the practice of anything he considered Jewish, such as Passover or the Sabbath or anything else. So here's his problem. He's the emperor of the Roman Empire. He needs to have it unified and united. It's united militarily. It's united politically. It's united economically. It's, it was the one world government of his time, see. But it wasn't united with the religion of the people. They had all these gods, and this was a problem for him. He wanted everybody worshiping the same God. because he was a sun worshiper God himself, which was the patron God of the Roman army. So he saw this emerging Christianity, it was, came to be called, how it was growing so fast among the masses. And he claimed to see a sign in heaven of the cross only God knows we'll, sh we'll find out on the other side one day some think it was just this, he was a sun god worshiper so we'll see one day you know but uh, he brought Christianity into being the eventually the official religion of the Roman Empire now think about that here's this dead Jew on a cross in Jerusalem and the people who follow him conquered the Roman Empire. Wow, think about it. But here's the problem. Constantine's empire was Greek and Roman people. They hated Jews. <laughs> They're not going to embrace this thing the way it is. So in his political savvy, he knew what to do. Well, we'll just take all the Jewish stuff out of it and put Greco-Roman names on it and change those statues over there to pagan gods and put Peter and Paul and Mary on top of them. And then the people can just keep doing what they've been doing, but now it's Christianized. Are you with me? This is, might be a shock to you. So he, he allowed the ongoing of what the people were doing, but put a veneer of Christianity on top of it. Which means he had to take anything Jewish out of it or it would not be accepted. That's what we've had for 1,700 years. During the next 1,200 years, many unbiblical practices were taught by the institutional church. Since people did not have a Bible and could not read, they did not know how to have peace with God. You see where this is going? The gospel of salvation by faith and faith alone was not preached nor understood. What happened was the political leaders just put on a bishop's hat. And now the politicians are head of the new religion of Constantine. And the people didn't know any different. They didn't know any better. They're just doing what they were doing, but now, they're not doing it in the home because Constantine closed down all the home church meetings. Everybody has to go to a basilica and, and learn the Constantine religion. For then, everybody met in homes. People sought salvation through religious rituals rather than personal faith in Jesus as their Passover lamb. Are you, are you with me here? And Constantine had the sword. So... He's enforcing this with a sword. So all these centuries, people in Europe, when they were born physically, they were born into Constantine's Christianity. They weren't born again with a personal salvation like we understand. They were Christian by birth in the Constantine version of it. So all these basic teachings in the Bible of faith and salvation and all of these things, grace and mercy, all of that was lost to the people. It just whatever Constantine's political bishops were teaching them, 
is what all oh, they knew. So these spiritual realities symbolized by the feast were lost to people. They had no idea how to find God at all. Well, Martin Luther, one of the most famous persons of all of history, at age 22, Martin Luther was knocked to the ground by a bolt of lightning. Now that would get your attention. <laughs> Amen. And he thought, wow, there's a God up there somewhere and I'm spared. He spared me for something. I'm gonna become a monk. That was his only opportunity, you know, for him in that day. So he became a monk. And uh, because of his theological orientation, his idea of trying to find peace with God was through all the rituals, see? All the rules, all the regulations. Crawl up these 12 steps while you're saying these prayers or whatever, you know. Do all this, fast and pray and uh, beat yourself up. And, and if it was today, he would, he would sleep on July 4th in Houston without the air conditioning. <laughs> He's, he's going to suffer enough that maybe he can make the big breakthrough and find peace with God. You with me? In the 1500s, God used Martin Luther. Now, he didn't know this, of course. He had to get the big picture to restore the spiritual meaning of the Feast of Passover to the Christian world. He sought peace with God through all the rituals and practices of the church. This did not give him peace with God, which left him unfulfilled. Many people do this today, don't they? All right, what else does it say? In 1515, took him a while, <laughs> Luther opened his Bible. Well, what a strange novel idea. I believe I'll read the book. He opened his Bible to Romans 117, and what does it say? The just shall live by faith. The Spirit of God just shines His light on that word faith and pow! All of a sudden, He had the great awakening that salvation had nothing to do with all these rituals and rules and institutional structures, but personal faith in Jesus as the Passover lamb who died for His sins. In 1517, Luther protested the sale of indulgences by the church, and this action triggered the Protestant Reformation that restored the spiritual reality of Passover and changed the course of history. Now, he didn't know th that he was doing what I'm telling you he did. <laughs> you know? But that's, that's, that's what the bottom line of it was. People had no idea how to have faith, how to have peace with God. It was all this institutional rituals and legalistic stuff and he brought that back the just shall live by faith as a quick side note unfortunately he was a man of his times and he was very anti-semitic he hated the jewish people unfortunately in fact uh, hitler used many of luther's own writings to justify a lot of things that hitler did in the holocaust and that's a sad thing. You can go to any Holocaust museum in the world, you'll, you'll see Martin Luther's quotes there. That's a sad thing, of course. But here's the deal. God doesn't have any perfect people to work with. Amen. So God did use him for what he wanted to use him for, to restore the spiritual reality of peace with God through Jesus as the Passover lamb. The prophetic season of unleavened bread, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. A couple of hundred years go by now, we're in the 1700s. And we have John and Charles Wesley. Uh, John was born in 1703 and lived almost the entire century. That's how important he was. Uh, Charles, a few years later, they, they, their deal was this. They had, there must be more to this salvation than just saying this little prayer and going down to the church on Sunday and filling up a pew. Surely God wants us to be holy. <laughs> it's called sanctification, to live holy lives. So this is, was their revelation. And so John experienced this personally in 1738. 
This is a history lesson for us, but it's spiritual history. When he felt his heart strangely warmed by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord. He was attending a service by a Moravian preacher. And guess what the Moravian preacher was preaching on? He was just reading commentary on Romans. He wasn't even preaching it. He was just reading the commentary on, on Paul's writings in Romans. And the Spirit of God touched John Wesley's heart. And he realized that true religion, they would call it in those days, was inward. It was a matter of the heart being changed on the inside. And that would be reflected on the outside. So this is what unleavened bread, personal holiness. And the other side of the coin is the next slide, his brother Charles. So first fruits, putting off the old, putting on the new. See, this is what we're talking about. They brought a restoration of the spiritual meaning of first fruits to, and unleavened bread to the Christian world. Although they faced much opposition from the church establishment, and this always happens throughout church history, it's always been the same. The grace and power of God worked through them mightily to bring a revival of holiness to God's people. Their preaching radically transformed the believers, which changed the society and social ills of the day. Their emphasis on holiness in the life of believers ignited a lasting spiritual renewal that restored Christian salt and life light to a decaying and darkened world. John was a circuit rider. See, up until that day, Christianity was a religion for the rich people. You had to buy your pew. You had your little name plate on it, you know. It wasn't for field workers and everyday people. John Wesley thought they were important too. He went out into the fields in the dark before the people went to their coal mines and worked. By the tens and hundreds of thousands, people came into a personal relationship with the Lord. All these charismatic signs and wonders, they happened in their, their men meetings. They didn't encourage them, they just happened because of the power of God's word. John Wesley rode 250,000 miles horseback. He would get the prize for the most frequent horse riding ticket. He would ride with the reins loose so he could write his little sermons as the horse is going. And sometimes the horse would collapse under him from so many miles, 250,000 miles. And Charles, he was the music guy. He was the singer, songwriter. Charles wrote over 6,000, 6,000 hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. Amazing. John would preach them and Charles would sing them. And they changed the world of the 1700s because they had this encounter with God that we would call unleavened bread and first fruits. And men, you probably know the Methodist denomination came out of the Wesleys because they were big on discipling people. They had methods, was in home groups for discipling people. George Whitfield was one of their buddies who was the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul probably and was very instrumental in the first great awakening in the new colonies of the United States. So you imagine John and George Wesley and George Whitfield, George Whitfield in the same home Bible study. Wow. The prophetic season of Pentecost restored. When Constantine organized Christianity into a religious system, the leaders chose a human-directed structure rather than a spirit-led and empowered church. You understand what that means, all those words mean? Man's going to take over. There's no place for God now because we, we got our program going here. While there has always been periodic localized revivals of Pentecost, the spiritual reality of the Feast of Pentecost was lost to the church. You know, there's... <laughs> Many mainline denominations today that think this is all of the devil. They don't even believe this is for anybody anymore. God began to restore Pentecost on a worldwide basis in the early 1900s. Let's look at the two at the bottom here. 
on New Year's Day, a good way for God to start off the new century. In 1901, God poured out his spirit at Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas, led by Charles Parham. He had a Bible school. And the Spirit of God fell on the people like it was in the book of Acts. It was a major deal. And uh, Parham began to preach on this all over the country. Came down to a little town called Houston to bring that message. And there was a black man named William Seymour. In that time period, they wouldn't let William Seymour in the sanctuary. He had to sit outside in the hallway and listen to the sermons. But there was a opportunity for him to go to Los Angeles and pastor a little small little group of people meeting in a home in 1906. And God showed up. And there were so many people, they were standing all outside on the porches, and the porch collapsed because there were so many people. So they had to find a little meeting hall, a livery stable, sound familiar? Humble beginnings was William Seymour, son of former slaves, lost one eye with a disease he had had, tuberculosis or something, I don't remember. A one eyed black man former slave parents, but was a very humble man who preached with, whose, whose meetings he kept his head in a box. Strange for us, humbling himself until God showed up and told him something. So from 1906 to 1909, Azusa Street, you can Google all this, you know, uh, God poured out his spirit in a worldwide phenomena. The glory of God missed cloud, stayed in the room. Thousands of people were healed of amazing, unbelievable miracles. You can read books, read all about it. The fire of God would come down from heaven and from inside and meet in heaven up the top of the roof, and the fire department would be called. They thought it was, the buildings was on fire, you know. And the people said, as long as the mist of the glory of God was in the room, everybody received a huge miracle of some kind. And they would said, breathing, it was like breathing pure air. The glory of God's presence was in the building. The railroad station was a mile away. I'm just giving you a few ideas so you could see what was going on. And when people got off the train, just secular people, they would be slain in the spirit and fall to the ground. And the horses pulling the wagons would stop. There's people laying here on the street. Well, when this was noised abroad, good King James English, people from all over the world came. And they had their Pentecost Azusa Street encounter. And they went back from there to all over the world and spread that message in many of the greatest healing evangelists of modern times. He went all over the world had an encounter there at Azusa. It's so, so widespread that in spite of the fact that the establishment couldn't control God, today the majority of people who are believers are non-white, third world Pentecostal. God will have his way. All right, now we're looking at today and the future. Trumpets. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the Lord tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. So what do we have here? The fall feast. Now this is where we are now prophetically. The fall feasts are prophetic pictures of the great end time events and include trumpet atonement 
and tabernacles. Trumpets relates to spiritual warfare against God's people, Jews and Christians. You're reading what's going on in Israel this week. As, and will greatly increase, there we are, as we approach the end times. And I'm saying it this way. It seems that we are living in this prophetic season. That's kind of an understatement, you know. So look what it says. End time spiritual warfare against the Jewish people accelerated when Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany on January 30, 1933. And you know what resulted from that. In time spiritual warfare against the Christians accelerated in America when God was removed from the public arena in 1962 and 1963. You don't have to be very insightful as a believer to realize the establishment hates you. And all the policies coming out of our national leaders are anti-God anti-Christian, anti-Jew. And so we are living in a time of accelerated spiritual warfare, trumpets, atonement restored. These are now but future, so they're overlap a little, you understand? All right, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Hallelujah, good news. And who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. That's what atonement is, judging evil on the earth. The prophetic season of the Day of Atonement points to the return of Messiah Yeshua Jesus to judge the nations. See, that's what it's about prophetically. When the last shofar is blown at the Feast of Trumpets, you, you just kind of got to study this stuff to know what it's about. It signals the return of Jesus on the final great day of atonement. Trumpets and atonement seem to overlap, culminating in the return of Jesus to judge and make war against the enemies of God. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world, hallelujah, I added that, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, the Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So coming to judge and make war, trumpets and atonement, they're separate, but they overlap. And one more slide here for you. The prophetic season of tabernacles restored. Look at Zechariah 14, 16. Now this is our future. <laughs> It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, better put that in the headlines today, right? Shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to do what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So if all that is in the future, it certainly couldn't have been done away with. <laughs> so we need to learn about these things and kind of start practicing. One little story and then I'll end. I'm sorry it's taking so long here. Uh, in 1980, some Christians in Jerusalem had this great awakening and started organizing a Christian celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. It was part of this prophecy being fulfilled. And Peggy and I were blessed to be part of that for 20-something years. I was honored and blessed be a speaker there for 18 years. So what does that mean? In the Civic Center in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. The one in the book, you know. The Civic Center. 5,000 Christians from 100 nations come every year. All their flags, all their costumes, all their banners. And God allowed me to teach them about these issues and other similar things for 18 years. The Lord said, son, you can never go to a hundred nations. I'll bring them to you every year in Jerusalem. And those days we had cassette tapes. Some of you aren't old enough to remember those ancient things. They would get the cassette tapes, take them back to their nations and spread them all over the world. God allowed us to be part of that 
for all those years. And then he said, okay, now you've had your fun here. You, you, got your, you, you get to bring all this back to Houston now. So we did that for a long time in Houston. But we're still here. We're still bringing out the Word of God. And I hope you were blessed by this teaching. It's, it's, it was a longer introduction than I thought it might be. But next time we'll take each one of these that we just kind of skimmed over here and look at them in great detail. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. Amen and amen. God bless you. Shalom again, everyone. I truly hope you were blessed by the teaching. It's such an honor to share it with you. And I want to give you some information here now that is ways that we can work together, not only to help you in your walk with God, but take this important message. If it really means a lot to you and it's helping you, you can partner with us to help bring this message to so many other people all around the world. In this modern electronic age, it's amazing with such little effort how we can reach so many people with the Word of God. So let me tell you a few things that we can do together, okay? Number one, you can go to my website at www.rbooker.com and you can order so many different things that will help you really for the rest of your life. There are many, many books there. Many of them have study guides. You can order them right from our website. You can study them on your own. You can use them in your home groups. You can use them in your Sunday school class. It's so easy and they're really well balanced and focus on Jesus and they give you a Hebraic cultural understanding of the Bible. While there, you can go to our resources tab and check out our courses that we have with the Institute for Hebraic Christian Studies. IHCS is much simpler to say, has all these courses listed. We have uh, students from all over the world who take them, and you can take these courses yourself. We have a free download. Did I say free? Oh, absolutely. It's called The Root and Branches. If you go to your app store, it's an amazing multimedia presentation of the basic core Hebraic teachings in the Bible. It's got the PowerPoint pictures. It's got video, audio. It's a beautiful presentation, and it's free for you. Just go to your app store, type in Root and Branches, and it'll come up for you. If you're interested, you could contact us about hosting me and your church or congregation or home group. We still at our young age travel all over the world helping people and if it's possible, we'd be honored to come and speak to your group. Now, we're making these videos uh, for you at no charge and we're glad to do that. But uh, if you want to partner with us and and be a part of this ministry you can join with us and help us uh, by being a financial partner and we'll use your funds to help reproduce more of these products get them distributed all over the world prepare people for the coming of the messiah so you can join with us financially through paypal by making donations from our website or the old-fashioned way you know with a check or money order you can send the sounds of the trumpet. We'll put that on the screen for you at 4747 Research Forest Drive, 180-330, Spring, Texas, 77381. We'd love to hear from you. Love to have us work together, do something bigger than what we can do for ourselves. And so let me close this way by giving you this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. God bless you until we visit again with the next teachings. Amen and amen.